Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Epic Human Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Blair, and thanks for listening today. On today's episode, I'm excited to bring you my interview with Gaurav Jain, co-founder and managing partner of Afor Capital, a pre-seed stage venture capital firm based here in Silicon Valley. Gorov and I went to Harvard Business School together, but really got to know each other when I first moved here to the Bay Area less than a year ago. He has had an incredibly successful career as an entrepreneur and a VC, a good example of a person that is able to succeed on both sides of the fence. In this episode, you'll learn about his beginnings growing up in India, moving to Canada in high school, and how he made his way into the world of startups and eventually into venture capital. He'll tell you about some of the exciting companies he's invested in and what he looks for when making investments more broadly. He'll also talk about his decision to become a VC, what he likes about it, and what he finds challenging. I appreciated Gorov's candor and sense of humor throughout this podcast. I hope you enjoy it. I certainly had a blast learning more about his story. So without further ado, please give it up for an epic human, Gorov Jane. All right, we are live with Gurav Jain of Afore Capital. How are you doing today? I'm good, Joe. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Life is good. Uh, thanks for having me over here. It's a pleasure. Thank you for uh, for doing this. And it's uh, it's an honor to be part of your uh, first few uh, <laughs> podcasts in the series. Thank you. The, the flagship podcast. You, you, I'm glad you feel honored. Um, yeah, well, thanks, uh, thanks for agreeing to chat with me. Um, uh, would love to just start by learning a little bit more about the origin stories. I'm a big Marvel comic uh, geek from when I was younger, so uh, the origin story of superheroes is always uh, <laughs> interesting to me. So I would love to hear the origin story of uh, of Gorb Jain. Sure. So I was born in uh, in India in a small town in India. Uh, grew up grew up in India. Uh, frankly, uh, looking back, and I think about this sometimes. Growing up, if you had told me in you know, 20, 25 years, I'd be sitting in Silicon Valley and doing this podcast with you, I'd tell you you're crazy. <laughs> uh, I grew up in a small town just north of Delhi uh, in India. My dad was an entrepreneur. Uh, he started a company in kind of late 80s. So it's sort of all I've known if, as far as my dad's career is concerned is running his own business. You know, it's a small business, manufacturing, um, parts for kind of photocopying machines. Uh, he's an engineer by trade. Mm. Uh, so did that in the 90s, but I guess one day, late 90s, he uh, he woke up and wanted to move out west. He felt there were better opportunities for my sister and I in North America. We had done a trip out to Canada and the US. I think he was intrigued by what he saw um, and just just applied for, for, I guess, immigration or you know think of the Canadian version of a green card. Mm. Uh, and we got accepted. So we moved in 2000 to Canada. I was still in high school. For my sister and I, it sounded just a fun experience, frankly. I don't think yeah. we were old enough to quite comprehend what moving across the the world entails. Uh, so finished high school in Canada. So, so uh, real quick, did your did your family have to give up the business? Yeah, so my, my dad uh, sold his business. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think even he probably did not fully comprehend what... Uh, how big of a change he was signing up for <laughs> because, you know, he had a comfortable life, uh, yeah. you know, running his own business, being his own boss. Uh, I think he really enjoyed that. Uh, but but I guess he's an entrepreneur and risk taker, you know, just <laughs> at the core of it. Mm. Uh, so I think at some level he's probably feeling bored, kind of just running his business and uh, and wanted to, you know, wanted to move to, to, to North America, to Canada in our case. Uh, so what, he sold the business. And, and what did he do? Uh, yeah. Or what did your, fam- your parents do? So we literally showed up here in September, or in Canada, September 2000. And uh, and my, you know, my sister, my, I was in grade 10, my sister grade 6. My dad used to find a job. And <laughs> and, and we, we, you know, we don't have a house. We, don't, like, we literally had like seven suitcases we showed up with. No right. Um, wow. and, and that was it. And now I, my mom's sister lives in Toronto, so they kind of, you know, hosted us for a month or so. We found an apartment. But it, it kind of was like starting from scratch. I mean, it wasn't exactly scratch because, you know, my parents had made some money and we were able to kind of, you know, um, kind of start a little bit farther ahead because uh, my parents were in their mid-40s. Yeah. But it was effectively pressing reset, right? Yeah. Um, 
because uh, my dad was wasn't going to start a new business, and it's also hard to start a business right, right. in a new country. So he was going to go find a job, and he hadn't had a job for for many years. <laughs> so it wasn't easy. Yeah, and you know, I mean, you and I went to you know business school in the U.S. and have a have a network. Uh, but imagine you know showing up in this country and a lot of you know finding jobs in this part of the world is about who you know and not necessarily what you know. Yeah. Uh, and even though, you know, he's an engineer by, by, by training and been running a company, you didn't have a network. And it was actually really, really hard mm. uh, to get started. Mm. Right. So he had to effectively start at the bottom. But, you know, he's entrepreneurial. He's hardworking. He's smart. So he was able to quickly um, progress and, and increasingly get better jobs. And they're pretty well settled now in, in Toronto, you know, 18 years later. Uh, but it was, certainly was much harder for, for, for my parents than it was for my, my sister and I. Mm -hmm. I think what that meant was it made things a lot easier in a lot of ways for, for certainly me because, you know, I went to high school in Canada, which makes it a lot easier to go to college. Uh, so I went to University of Waterloo uh, up, in, up in Canada for software engineering. Mm -hmm. um, Waterloo has this interesting program where you work and study every four months. Oh, um, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's that. called the co-op program. Sure. So, you know, when I was 19... Uh, I got a job at BlackBerry. Okay. This is 2004, and uh, at the time, you know, BlackBerry was sort of the king of the smartphone ecosystem. So yeah. I was writing code, you know, and my and I'm still a teenager, <laughs> making money, which is a lot of fun. Anyway, uh, did um, did stints at IBM and Amazon. Um, yeah, cool. And um, first off, I think that's a fantastic program. I did a co-op when I was at, at Lehigh. Um, and the, the experience you get like when you're in the middle of your schooling and then you get to kind of apply that or, or at least kind of reference check it with the thing, types of things you're learning and, and, and uh, rationalize, okay, I actually will use some of these skills here or there. Uh, my brother went to uh, Northeastern University. Okay, that yeah, has a similar, similar program. program. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to me. So, so, so you were there. Just real quick, back to coming to Canada. I'm, I'm just curious. When you were in high school, yeah, how were you feeling like on coming to Canada? Was it were you were you nervous? Were you excited? Were you did, did it meet your expectations? I mean, because that's a big change for a teenager, which are and teenage years are notoriously tough and awkward. And I'm just curious about how that was for you. Yeah, honestly, it was mostly exciting. I think part of the reason. <clears throat> it wasn't nerve wracking for me was I was academically pretty good right yeah. back in India and India is like a couple of years ahead of, you know, North America in terms of kind of grade level. Mm. Uh, so when I came in, even though I started school, so we moved in September, school starts in September, but I couldn't start my classes till mid October. Cause you know, you have to do all these tests and stuff and mm. they, they, they kind of put you in the right grade level. I know it's crazy. <laughs> um, but I joined school like a month and a half late, but I, I hit the ground running, right. Cause I'd done the same material like a year or two years okay. before. I remember my first day, uh, sitting in chemistry class and the teacher asked a question and I was like the only one to put up my hand and the teacher's like, guys, like the rest of the class, what's going on? Like this kid just started <laughs> school today and like month and a half late and, you know, knows the answer and none of you do, like what's going on? So, you know, I, so I think the academic part was, came easy, yeah. um, which is obviously a big part of, you know, um, your life at that, at, that, at that stage. So that was easy. Uh, culturally, you know, I spoke English, right, coming in. I think that made life a lot easier. Uh, the medium of instruction in India, the school I was in was English. So you kind of, that makes it, makes it a lot easier and look it's just a lot less conservative right i grew up as a teenager for example my school back home in in india uh a girl could only go to my school if your brother was already studying there which i know is like a weird weird rule huh. what that meant it was like there was like 50 guys and like 10 girls for every class and it was just an, an overlay like a very conservative culture on on top of that yeah and you come to canada and it's like you know, guys, you know, girls and guys are going out, having a good time. You're just like, this is amazing, right? And, like academics are easy, and and like uh, and like the personal life is just like so much more fun. You can actually like talk to girls, take them on a date. Like it's, this is this is incredible. Sure. Um, so so really, it was it was uh, it wasn't that bad, I'd say for. For, for us, I mean, there were certainly the idea of like leaving your friends back home, and you know, the internet that was was there obviously, but the communication channels weren't as good as what it is today. So definitely lost touch with friends back home. But 
uh, I think the the excitement of of this new adventure was was uh, you know was enough to kind of keep us occupied. That's cool. And uh, and did you when did you acquire the Canadian accent or or the North American accent? Yeah, um, I mean it wasn't obviously a deliberate kind of uh, <laughs> effort. I think what was what what I did in retrospect, which which was good, uh, which wasn't planned was that a lot of people when they move from that part of the world at the age that I did tend to stay in their comfort zone mm -hmm. right so it would have been especially you know I, I moved to Toronto it's very multicultural there are tons of immigrants from India and Pakistan and China and so on and so forth it's very easy it would have been very easy to stay in that community mm -hmm. right because that community understands where we came from speaks the language you know, the, the culture, you know, the sports, whatever, like it would have been very easy, but I made a conscious effort to, to get to know the, 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 I don't know, the locals, but like the, the folks that are not immigrants, right? The, the, the native population, um, I, I really made an effort to be outside of my comfort zone, which certainly helped in the accent as, as one of those things, but a lot of other things about the culture, mm. right? Uh, which I, I totally see a lot of my, friends who were in the similar boat didn't do that mm -hmm. and you know i always felt you know what's the point of moving to canada if you're going to still stay in india right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's very easy to by the way stay in quotes in india in, in inside of canada right you can sounds of indian grocery stores you can play cricket all you want you can hang out with indians sure but that, i feel like that defeats the purpose mm -hmm. right i think you ha you should and you have to assimilate in the community if you're going to move um it's daunting for sure, right? Because, um, you know, you, you touched upon how, you know, it can be hard being a teenager. Now I imagine on top of that, you know, you don't understand any of the cultural references, any of the pop culture. You don't, you don't speak, you don't, your accent is a little off. And, yeah, yeah. you know, um, and your parents are going through a very different, you know, phase of life than all their other parents. And, you know, you don't have a car. I mean, let my, my, my dad got a car a year after we moved, right? <laughs> so, like, you know, it, it, it's a very different um, life. Uh, but, but I do think it's really important to, um, to, to you know, assimilate yourself and not, not kind of isolate. That's interesting. We, um, as I've been doing a few of these, it seems like there's a common theme with people who purposefully do the harder thing, like purposefully put themselves in the uncomfortable position. Um, because like you said, it, it would have been easier or more comfortable just to stay to the communities or the, you know, have those cultural norms with people that, um, that shared your background. But uh, that's, uh, but, you know, so good on you for taking that step. That was, that was clearly the harder step. Um, Okay, cool. So, so back back on track. So you you you're at Waterloo and you're studying computer science. Is that right? And, and software did, engineering. Yeah. Okay, software engineering, and you're doing these uh, these internships, and then you're you're close to graduation. And what are you what are you thinking you want to do at that point? Yeah, you know the the Waterloo co-op program, and I encourage anybody who gets an opportunity to do something like what Waterloo has, and in, in Northeastern has something similar, because what it allowed me to do. So I did six internships while I was still an undergrad. Wow. What that means though, is it takes five years to graduate yeah. rather than four, and you don't get any summers off, right? Yeah. So, because these, these, these internships are each four months long, so you, you're either studying or working, there's no, there's no summer. Uh, but what that allows you to do is you get this perspective uh, th that uh, your peers who are, who are also graduating just, just don't have. I mean, I've, I, when I'm coming close to graduation, I've worked at Six different countries, six different companies at probably like three different countries, you know, different continents. Like, it, it, so you get you get this amazing perspective, and I guess one of the things that I took away from my internships was that uh, I actually did not want to want a job right, coming out of school. Mm. I actually wanted to start something, mm. um, and and the idea of starting something um, of your own, it takes a certain amount of courage and um, and confidence that I think you can only get if you've been out there for, for a little bit or if you're really naive. I guess I was, I was a bit of both. Hmm. Um, so anyway, with a couple of my friends from software engineering, um, we started a company. Uh, we started a company and we started about the, the company about a year before we graduated. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you know, we were able to hack on, on, on the side while we were doing school and 
by the time we graduated, we were in a place to be able to raise money. Um, so the, the idea with the company was very simple, right? So I'd worked at BlackBerry in 2004. Uh, BlackBerry was started at Waterloo, right? Um, hmm. It was a University of Waterloo graduate. Um, we were sitting in BlackBerry's backyard, literally BlackBerry headquarters, even now are adjacent to University of Waterloo. So we're sitting in, in this, in this uh, you know, um, uh, in this interesting place in 2007. Um, BlackBerry is selling like hot cakes. Um, and we kind of look at this um, this ecosystem that's coming together and say, we want to be a part of it. We want to do something here. And our simple idea was, why don't we take magazine and newspaper content, right, and make it basically make it BlackBerry friendly, mm-hmm. right? So at the time, I don't know if you had a BlackBerry back back in the day, but mm-hmm. uh, the office productivity apps were great, right? Email, phone, calendar, so on and so forth. But when it came to consuming rich media, it was actually a pretty terrible experience, yeah. right? Because yeah. BlackBerry never really invested in that. I think that was <clears throat> part of the reason why, you know, they really lost the race, even though they were um, arguably, you know, really invented the whole smartphone ecosystem. Yeah. Because it was very much an enterprise B2B product, so they never felt that, you know, this sort of consumer media was was important, you know, for them. Right. But we, we noticed that increasingly executives and folks that have Blackberries are Wanting, they're, they're wanting to consume this content, right? They want to check their stocks, they want to check the scores, they want to read the news. So essentially what we built was a platform that could ingest this rich media content, whether that's you know text or video, and basically through a native app, let you consume that online or offline, right? So one of the big things with BlackBerry was you can you can you know check your email and respond while you're offline, you know, for mm. example, when you're on a plane. Mm-hmm. So we allowed you to do that as well. Uh, but we wanted to do it in a way that we're not a, just a custom dev shop. So we actually built this sort of SaaS like platform that would take this content in XML and you know you can reskin the app so you can have multiple multiple different apps. So we built the first uh, smartphone apps for Time Magazine, CNN Money, Sports Illustrated, Business Week. Look, we're the right place, right time, and we had the right background, right? Having come engineers out of you know Waterloo and BlackBerry, <laughs> BlackBerry's doing really well, mm. and media companies. When we would talk to them, you know had barely figured out their online strategy and now this mobile thing was starting to happen and and here we are telling them we can have them on all the platforms within a week with their branding that was just a very um compelling value prop so we started the company uh, built the software kind of nights and weekends um you know got a few customers our first two customers were canadian business and mclean's which is two of the larger publications in canada we raised what would be called a pre-seed round of six hundred thousand dollars from an angel investor in summer of 2008 uh, it was an interesting time because the world kind of came to an end, end of 2008, early 2009. Hmm. Thankfully, we uh, we squeaked by and we raised a Series A in early 2009. The company is still running. Uh, my best friend's CEO, um, you know, raised over 10 million dollars in venture financing, um, about 50 employees, doing a lot more than just um, just you know mobile uh, mobile publishing, doing work in native advertising, so on and so forth. But anyway, that experience would not have happened. If it wasn't for sort of the internship experience that we got, you know, being at Waterloo, and of course, you know, a lot of different things came together between BlackBerry and smartphones and mobile, uh, and, and and having a couple of friends that were also very entrepreneurial um, that wanted to do something similar. And had you always known you wanted to do something entrepreneurial? Where did that come from? Not really. I mean, you know, when I look back, you know, my dad was was on, was an entrepreneur, so I guess there was some kind of exposure to that. Uh, but to be honest, when I went to Waterloo in 2003, uh, my dream was to work at Microsoft one day as an engineer, hmm. right? And truth be told, like that was uh, that was the ultimate, you know, Microsoft in 2003, 2004 is, you know, the best tech company out there. You know, this is pre-Google, pre-Facebook, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, you know, and, and being an engineer was a very highly coveted position, right? You get to work in the U.S., you get to make good money, good brand. And that was it, right? And then as 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 time goes by, that vision then evolves from well, Microsoft's not cool anymore. There's the other companies, cloud companies that are cooler, Google and others. I worked at Amazon in 2005. Mm. You know, that was like, oh, this is really interesting. And then maybe maybe I want to work at Google. And then as I'm you know getting more and more exposed to the world and 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 through my friends and and events and so on and so forth, you know, this I get exposed to entrepreneurship and startups and how there's people that will write you a check, you know. Um, with an idea, right? When you have, before you have anything and, and, and you can create all this value really quickly and, 
you know, so, so you know, I've, I've always believed in, you know, what Steve Jobs has said, right, which is you connect the dots looking backwards. Mm-hmm, and right. when I look back at, at, at my trajectory, as I said, like 20, 25 years ago, if you told me that's what my trajectory would be, I'd tell you you're crazy. Yeah. Um, and, and, and even now being in venture, like I, when I started a company, I didn't think I'd be in venture, right? I, even though I raised money from VCs, it was like, oh, cool, that's, that, that's what you do, but I want to be an entrepreneur. And then things happen and then, you know, um, you learn more about yourself and, and what you want to do and you kind of evolve the path. Um, so I've always believed in kind of uh, focusing, and this may be a little counterintuitive, but like focusing on the short term, or maybe short to medium term and not too much in the long term. I think you should have a vision, an idea of what you want to do in the long term, but I think you should, you should um, you know, hold those, those, those beliefs kind of loosely, right? Yeah. Um, so a cu- couple things that uh, I'm, I'm thinking about as, as I hear you talk. One big advantage of the the co-op program um, or just internships in general is that they they enable you to experiment with your career in terms of you try something and oftentimes the thing you think you want to do, as soon as you try it, you know pretty quickly, okay, this isn't actually what I want to do. Um, and the more reps you can, you can have uh, before you have to commit down a path, I think the better off you're going to be because you, you've at least crossed off a few things that you know you don't want to do. And that's just as valuable as like trying to figure of, of nailing down what you might want to do. Um, and, and I think one of the, one of the risks of, of not doing those internships or not experimenting or not uh, investigating is you, you graduate, whether it's, it's undergrad or, business or, or, or graduate school, and you kind of commit down a path and you're kind of committed for a couple years, maybe not, not explicitly, but implicitly. Um, and then when people try to shift their careers, it, it tends to be, um, a lot of times it tends to be more lateral type movements or, or pivots from where they are. Whereas if they can, you know, the early, I, th- I always say like the earlier in your career you can rapid fire test as many things you think you might want to do, um, the better off you're going to be because the sooner you can figure out what you really want to do, um, the, uh, you can go straight there. I mean, I'm always skeptical of people saying, if you want to do this, you have to go do this for five, ten years. I totally agree with you. And it's not too dissimilar, frankly, to what we tell entrepreneurs. Right. right. We tell right. them to launch quickly, right? Launch a product that uh, they would be ashamed of right. and not very proud of, right? Because right. it's so rough. But iterate, right? Learn from feedback from customers. And I think that's so true as well in personal life. Because the longer you go down a path, the more committed you are, right? The more that gets calcified as right. like, you know, this is what I should be doing. And for good reason, right? Because you learn a lot about that path, that career, that job, that role, the more you build a network, the more you have, you know, whatever reason, you're deeper and deeper into that, into that whole, I don't want to say whole, whole sounds negative, but like you're deeper down that path and, 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 the, and the switching costs are higher. Yeah. So the, 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 the earlier that you can iterate, the better it is. And, and in my case, it was an undergrad, which is pretty early, right? Yeah. But, but that's not, you know, certainly... Uh, you can do something similar, you know, post graduation, or you know, we went to business school, which allows you another kind of inflection point to yeah. to iterate. Uh, but I, I agree with you. I think that uh, that self discovery um, and that iteration is really, really key because uh, in m- most cases, people will realize what, that their 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 vision, you know, was 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 far off from what they really, you know, yeah. should or want to be doing. Yeah. That, that reminds me, I mean, that's, that also speaks a lot to the startup world and, and the culture of, uh, like you said, of iterating quickly. Um, I always tell the story of when I, when I got out of school, I worked for a giant company, a big engineering company, and I worked for it for three, four years. And by the end of that four years, I figured I didn't want to be an engineer, right? I didn't want to be an engineering manager, which is what they were grooming me for. And I remember I went and talked to the general manager of the business unit we were working, I was working for. I said, I think I actually want to get into sales. And he kind of, he kind of sighed and, and he, he grimaced and he said, well, you know, the company's put a lot of money into making you an engineer. And maybe after a few more years of engineering, you could transition and, and work under a salesperson and... And then after a few years of that, maybe we get you into a training course. And a few years after that, maybe you could get your own account. Mm. And I thought, man, that sounds like a 
real pain. I don't want yeah. to do that. Um, shortly after, less than a year, I, I ended up working for a, a startup. I was going from a 90,000 person company to a 60 person company. And I had the same conversation with, with, the, new, with the, the CEO. I said, I'm, I know I'm an engineer, but I, I really want to get into sales. And his response was, go, sell something right now. Just tell me how it goes, you know, all hands on deck, whatever you can do. And, uh, and to me, and that it was an immediate click for me. I knew that's, that's the environment I wanted to be a part of. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. yeah and, and, and startups, you know, allow you to do that. And I think that's also why maybe early on in your career, startups might be a, a good place to be to discover, right? To yeah. try different things and discover what, you know, what, what fits better. And it's not to say that sales is better than engineering. I think it's just a personal, you know, preference, yeah. right? Some people thrive as engineers and, and should do that for the rest of their li- lives whether that's you know you work want to work in NASA or whatever that is and some people you know like us are more sort of on the business side or outbound and, and, and that's fine too but I think it's an, it's important to kind of discover early what that is what that is for you um, because I think our point is like is like switching costs becomes harder and harder the yeah. longer the right. longer you go. Right, right, right. That that self awareness, the the quicker you can get it, the better. The, the Chandler, I guess, was interned for like an ad agency, didn't he? Like at some point from friends, you watch oh, friends at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, remember he was like he was like, Oh, I want to do advertising and he had to become an intern. It was actually really hard for him. <laughs> you, you don't remember the reference? I don't remember that. Yeah, because but... he was like an accountant or something, right? And he yeah, hated yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, and he right. was like, Oh, I want to go into advertising and yeah. they made him an intern and he was like an intern with like all these like you know, 22 year olds and, and it was hard because, you know, he was the oldest guy there. But, you know, some people do it, but I think it's really hard to pivot, you know, later on in your career. It is hard. It is hard. Um, so so you, you started this company. It did well. You, you raised some money. And then and then what was the what was the point that when you decided you wanted to do something different? Yeah. Uh, so we started the company in early 07 uh, and <clears throat> I, you know, it was an interesting experience, and it was my first time starting a company, and I learned a lot. You know, and one of the biggest things I learned was that building a company, it's like it's like running a marathon, mm. right? And what that means is it, it takes it's a long journey. It, it takes a lot of time, and uh, and you cannot run it like a sprint, mm-hmm. right? And what that means is, you know, if you ran a marathon like a sprint, you would definitely be leader of the pack for the first few miles and you'd be like oh this is so easy like why is everybody like running so slow like you know it's crazy but then by the time you hit like you know miles seven or eight you'd you'd yeah. you'd, you'd be done right, right? You'd, you'd be burned out you'd be you'd, you know that's the reason why you know veteran marathon runners really pace themselves sure um and, and that was really interesting you know because because here i am um you know starry-eyed all excited about building a company you know looking at you know what Google and, and others have done uh, and seeing the amount of value they've created in such a little time and you put a lot of pressure on yourself and what that means is you and you you know and this is where I, I don't like when people celebrate you know working like 20 hour days seven days a week mm-hmm. for like years I just don't think for most people that's sustainable mm-hmm. and and when that's what's celebrated in, in the entrepreneurial circles you know that's what you expect of yourself and i can tell you in my case like two two and a half years in i was like burnt out yeah. right yeah. um because i've you know literally the day after we finish our final exams for or for college like we're, we're full time at the office you know working insane hours i, I got a, a apartment right next door to the office so like i can minimize my commute and um and it was, it was it was good probably for the first year year and a half because we got all this traction and was able to get the business off the ground but then you realize you're, it's just really unsustainable, and mm-hmm. now you like sort of set this expectation for your of yourself on, on what you want to want to do. So anyway, like two and a half years in, once the business got to a pretty a good place, we you know we just closed our Series B, and you know it was like maybe 30, 35 employees. I took some time off, right, just really just take a breather, frankly, more than anything else. I talked to my friend who was a CEO. I said you just take some time off, travel a little bit. Um, I did that for a couple couple months, and and I think I realized that I. I wanted to do something different at that point. Um, and I wanted to actually move to Silicon Valley. I'd never actually done a single internship or never worked here in the Valley. I'd mm-hmm. heard a lot about it. Um, and one thing led to another, um, and given my, my experience in mobile, a friend of mine who was at the time at, at Google, um, you know, mentioned that, you know, and the I mean, obviously I'd heard of Android, I'd known of it, but the Android was looking for someone um, to help grow market share, right? And this is the time when Android is like a number four operating system uh, beh- behind, you know, BlackBerry, iOS, Windows Mobile. 
uh, but they're looking for somebody with mobile experience to, to grow, help grow market share. It's, it's uh, hard, just real quick, it's hard to remember a time when Windows Mobile I had know. an advantage over oh anybody. My but God. <laughs> yeah, seriously, but, right? But, but go on. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, we joke, but it was like literally less than 10 years ago. Yeah, right. right? Uh, which is crazy. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I, I, long story short, I, I joined the Android team as one of the early product managers. Um, you know, at the time, there's like less than a million people total using Android. Um, wow. There's like only a couple of phones that were really um, you know using Android, and, and the big part of my mandate was to get you know OEMs to adopt Android, right? Because Google never had the intention of getting into the hardware space, you know, um, uh, like Apple and, and build their own phones or anything like mm-hmm. that. So the strategy was going to be to get OEMs to adopt it. And at the time, only Motorola had really kind of you know seriously you know adopted Android. Everybody else. Samsung, LG, HTC were either using Windows Mobile um, or thinking of building their own own operating system. Mm-hmm. So the strategy for us was to basically launch the Nexus product line. So I was I was um, I was the lead PM for Nexus One. Um, it, what the strategy there was let's um, let's kind of take you know take matters in our own hands. Let's launch a phone that we will pay for as Google. We'll contract out in that case with HTC. We'll pay them to build this phone. But it'll really showcase, you know, how far Android had come, mm. how they, you know, Android was going to be a, com- you know, a compelling uh, alternative to iOS, right? Which really at the time was uh, was the the best game in town, um, and, and that way the OEMs will go, huh? Like this is an amazing Android phone, and this is available for free, and it's open source, and we can customize and so on and so forth. Let's adopt Android instead of building something of our own or Windows Mobile, which costs like twenty-five dollars a device and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, for, for Google, you know, more more web-enabled phones was better because you know that's how they make re- revenue right. and so on and so forth. So anyway, I joined the Android team late '09. And um, yeah, um, it was such an incredible journey to kind of see Android grow from you know million total users to uh, a couple of years later, you know, million new installations a day. Um, and of course, you know, today it's like 2 billion plus, you know, total users. And, you know, I was just in India recently. It's like 99%, you know, Android market share and, wow. and people that otherwise would not have had smartphones, right, right? Can now, you know, afford a smartphone. And of course, all the amazing, you know, apps and products on top of that that are possible. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the ancillary benefits of like things like, you know, Uber and Lyft and, and, and others. So anyway, that, that's what I did for a couple of years before, before business school. Cool. And then, and so that's where we connected in business school. Um, and then while at business school, uh, what were you thinking? I, I mean, well, I guess first off, why did you go to business school? Yeah. Um, you know, I had a great time at, at Google, but to, by the, you know, kind of a couple of years in, uh, I started to realize that Google was uh, becoming too big for my, my taste. I mean, Google's an incredible company for the size it is, but it's still a big company. I mean, right. you can't, you can't um, fight the laws of physics, right? <laughs> like if the company, you know, when I joined, it was, I don't know, maybe 10, 15,000 people. By the time I left, it was like 55,000. Like when you grow that fast and, and at that size, it's just things slow down. Um, and I still think it's a very entrepreneurial company of that size, but, you know, things happen slowly. And, you know, the interesting part of Google is um, because the, the core business is like a cash cow, you know, when you're in like ancillary businesses like like Android, even if, you don't necessarily make money and or launch you know products quickly. The company still keeps growing, which <laughs> at some level is very uh, uncomfortable for me because uh, <laughs> I want to be you know having direct impact on the bottom line. Sure, sure. Um, so anyway, I, I wanted to do something different. I, I had a few options, you know, maybe you know join a startup. I wasn't in a place where I wanted to start something, but I started thinking about kind of reflecting personally what I wanted to do and. You know, I'd been exposed to venture as a venture back founder, and it was always something that I was intrigued by. So I thought maybe, you know, maybe I wanted to venture, um, but, you know, I could go straight to work at a venture capital firm, but maybe I want to take some time off. I, there's a bunch of things kind of, um, you know, that I was toying with, um, and this opportunity um, to go to business school was, was one of them. Um, and I only I only applied to Harvard uh, because I wasn't really in a place where I said I really want to go to business school, right? Because being in Silicon Valley, like, MBAs are not highly valued, yeah. um, as, as you as you know, and um, so it wasn't like a, a, a natural path, right? For, for friends coming from McKinsey, it's like a very natural right. thing to do. When you're in tech, you're in Silicon Valley, it's not a very natural thing to do. So I didn't want to like um, so MBA was just one of many options, but I applied, I got in, um, 
And and I the reason I, I I chose that path was I felt it'll give me a couple of years to to try again going back to the whole iterating thing I was at a point where I I thought venture was what I wanted to do but I wasn't sure mm-hmm. but it would allow me to kind of try it and um, you know and see if this is what I liked um, I'd meet some really interesting people I felt like I wanted to broaden my network beyond just Silicon Valley beyond just tech and I felt that especially at Harvard given that it's such a global institution that I I would get to do that. And then I wanted to kind of invest a little bit more on my, my sort of, you know, hard skills on the business side, finance. You know, I'd been I was an engineer, I'd been in product, I'd never really done, and I started a company, but like, you know, it was a startup, right? You don't really get, um, you know, you're kind of learning on the job, you don't really get to kind of learn from the experts. So I felt like that, you know, for a couple of different reasons might be a good next step. Um, and then when I showed up at, at HBS, you know, very much I was in the mode of, I want to find some kind of interesting gig adventure so I, I can try it right while I'm here. And if I like it, I'll pursue it. If not, then, you know, I'll go back to product or, or something in, in the Valley. Got it. Got it. Interesting. Uh, and then how quickly, how quickly did you get into venture uh, after coming to business school? Because uh, you, you're probably unique in that you had an idea of what you wanted to do and you ended up doing it. Where most people, they have an idea of what they want to do to business school and then they they are presented with the cornucopia of options and they end up, you know, realizing they want to do something different. Yeah, and I guess I could argue maybe I, I should have been a little bit more open-minded and not be doing something different today, but I came in very focused uh, that I wanted to do venture. Um, so, you know, we started school in September um, 2011 and uh, by February, January of February, I was working 10 to 20 hours a week at a venture fund. Right. Um, So I I, I started school. I, you know, look, I, I, because I was in the Valley, I started talking to funds even before business school. Once we got in, right, this summer, um, you know, I I was obviously, you know, almost out of Google and and started talking to funds here and said, look, I'm I'm going to, you know, start at HBS, but I'm going to be looking for an internship and so on and so forth. So starting to get to know people. Um, so I started a fund called Founder Collective in uh, early 2012. The nice thing with them was they were based in Harvard Square, so it was like literally around the corner. Oh, nice. Um, and it was it was the two founders. I mean, the reason the fund is called Founder Collective is because it started by folks that had started companies themselves, right? Uh, mm. so it's like sort of founders investing in founders. Um, and that's very core to their ethos. So it was two, two guys that started, both HBS grads from 03 that had started companies and been successful. Um, and we're now initially we're angel investing in essentially they raised a fifty million dollar vehicle to invest a little bit more institutionally. Uh, so they were looking for some help, right? They were looking for sort of additional bandwidth, uh, but they were looking for somebody with kind of founding background and, mm. and tech and so on and so forth. So I, I, I fit that profile, um, you know, nicely. So I, I started with them, um, and, which was uh, frankly in retrospect was an incredible experience for me because. Um, you know, just like how you talked about, you know, when you are at a startup, you just get an opportunity to do stuff. Yeah. Uh, you don't, you don't need too many people's permission. You know, when I was, it was essentially a startup fund, right? It was just two guys, and, and I was the third person to join the team. I got a chance to actually get meaningfully involved in deals, whether that's sourcing them, whether that's like, you know, pounding my fist on the table and, and making a case to get stuff done. I was able to kind of um, impact the outcomes, right? And mm-hmm. I think that was, um, especially in venture, is so important because it's easy to be kind of a fly on the wall. It's easy to just sort of um, do the academic exercise of diligence, but it's much harder to have the conviction to pull the trigger and kind of stand by your decisions. And a lot of them, your times you're going to be wrong. So <laughs> to be able to to kind of uh, put your name next to, you know, all of them is, is important. So anyway, so I, 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 I spent a lot of time, you know, our, our first year in business school at, at the office working working with the uh, working with the team there. Then I did my my summer internship with them full time mm-hmm. uh, for three months. Uh, continued working with them part time uh, through our second year, and then I joined them full time um, once we graduated in 2013. And I made a commitment to to work there for three years uh, post graduation, uh, primarily because I wanted to move down back to the valley. Um, mm-hmm. I really, even though I'm not from here originally, I really this is where my heart is, and of course, you know, for what we do, this is where the action is as well. And I really wanted to be here long term. But you know, felt that the opportunity in the moment was great. Um, and, and again, talking about kind of connecting the dots, looking backwards, uh, when I started at Founder Collective in 2012, or when I joined full time, I didn't know post three years what I was going to do. I mean, I knew I wanted to be in venture because I enjoyed it um, while I was working with them, you know, through HBS. But what post Founder Collective life would look like was a big question mark, and I was comfortable with that because I felt like over time that'll become a little bit more clear. 
Yeah, this is something I've been thinking about more and more just in the past few years. I, I think if you want to be in the startup VC world, uh, I think you have to be comfortable with uncertainty beyond and put a time limit on it beyond two years, beyond three years. Um, it, and that's the way I kind of define risk tolerance is if you can be comfortable with the uncertainty of not knowing w where you're going to be in the next three years or after the next three years, two years, um, then I think you, you might have what it takes to be in this community um, for, the, for the short term or for the long term. Uh, but we know plenty of people, um, you know, friends, family, who th that's as far away from something they'd be comfortable with um, as you can imagine. They want to know, hey, I'm working for a company that I can see myself working here for the next 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is, or at least an industry, right? An industry or a, or a, a function that I can be doing. But I think um, the, just the dynamics of, of this world, you, ha you can't rely on that um, and you can't... Uh, can't put your faith in it necessarily, uh, and it takes uh, it takes self confidence because you have to believe. Okay, whatever I'm doing, whether it's you know on, on the operating side or the financing side, it could blow up, and, and we've seen it. We see it blow up every day um, on both sides. Uh, but you you kind of have to have that self confidence of knowing whatever happens, I'm gonna be fine. I'm gonna pivot. I'm gonna use my skills, my network, everything that I've learned, and do something else. Um, and that, that kind of ties back to what you were saying about, you know, being looking more short term, focusing on what sounds exciting now, um, as opposed to where do I want to be in ten years? Yeah, and look, I, I, you know, like it or not, I think everybody's going to be forced to embrace change. I feel like, especially, you know, because of technology, every industry is getting impacted. Right. Right. So I think it's really hide. It's really hard to hide from that from that change, right? Um, I don't know if that's good or bad for society. I feel like that's a much longer <laughs> conversation, right? Because um, I can totally see the value of some people just wanting to have the same job, having predictability and, and you know, uh, in their lives, right? In their work lives, at least, professional lives, right? Um, and having the security. I, I get the value of that. Um, but, be for you know, for better or for worse, I, it's just I think that's not going to be there in the next, kind of next you know few decades um you know i certainly look at you know we're at the cutting edge of you know technology because of what we do we get to see all these you know um you know robots and automation and all these different you know whether the software and hardware being built which is going to take some time to permeate you know for the rest of, to the rest of the society but it is going to create a lot of havoc so i i think it's you know you're you're better off just sort of being ready for yeah. that change and not not um, you know uh, expecting uh, that predictability because it's just not going to be there. Yeah, and I and I think we're probably the last, uh, like our generation is the last of the uh, of the young people that even view that as an option. I would I would probably say I think the 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 true millennials maybe we still classify as millennials, but the younger millennials. Um, they, they're growing up in this gig economy, right? Where you don't necessarily have to have a, a salary job. You can collect gigs, you can work, you can be flexible, you can travel. Um, and I think the, new, the younger generations are just becoming more comfortable with that flexibility. Not to mention the, uh, the disillusionment with seeing giant companies like GE cut 10,000 jobs, whatever, talk about being split apart. I mean, those those institutions that you know we all grew up with and our parents grew up with uh, are no longer guaranteed to last. So I would agree. So uh, th you did a three-year commitment there. You wanted to move back out here. And, and then what happened in the story? Yeah, I it started thinking about you know what's next, kind of end of 2015, reach out to a few um, close friends and, and mentors and advisors. And, and one of them, um, uh, was, is now my partner Anamitra. Uh, you know, him and I have known each other for for many years. We have a similar background in a lot of ways. We're both software engineers. Uh, we're both product guys. He was the first product manager at Twitter in sort of the 2008 timeframe. Uh, built a revenue NAS product there, and we had met in 
early 2012 because he was an EIR, an entrepreneur in residence at a fund called Foundation Capital. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was um, actually helping Foundation Capital uh, find investment opportunities at Harvard and MIT. So we met over dinner at one of the GP's houses uh, when I was out here and we hit it off right away because in sort of a sea of VCs, we were the only two kind of engineer product guys, a little bit did not belong. Um, (laughs) So we hit it off, we kind of stayed in touch and he ended up actually joining Foundation Capital as a full-time partner um, and we collaborated on a bunch of deals. So kind of end of 2015, as I'm trying to kind of, you know, come up for air and think about what's next, um, I reached out to him. I was out here. Um, we met up for coffee. And I shared with him um, kind of what I'm thinking. And, and, you know, interestingly enough, he was kind of in a similar place personally where, you know, he wanted to move. Uh, he wanted to do something different. He wanted to move kind of earlier stage. He was always very uh, envious of what I used to do at Founder Collective, kind of investing in seed. And very early, he used to do more Series A's and B's. Anyway, um, we started talking a lot uh, seriously of you know maybe doing something together, um, you know, and given the, the timing worked out perfectly. And, and the part that we were excited about a lot was um, you know investing super super early in startups, right? We were literally at the creation stage, um, which both of our funds we were getting a less and less chance to do. You know, my fund had started writing a little bigger checks later st- later on in the company's life cycle. Mm-hmm. His fund was already doing Series A's and B's. Um, so we had a shared passion around kind of investing super early. Uh, so we said, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work to, we'll, you know, be, you know, get together and, and start something new, um, you know, which is a fund we ended up starting called Afford Capital, uh, which is focused on um, this new emerging stage called pre-seed, which is really what, you know, seed rounds used to be. So we're investing, you know, somewhere between half a million to a million dollars when companies are just getting off the ground. Typically it's, a, you know, two founders in a garage, have a prototype, an interesting idea, maybe a little bit of traction, but not much else. And most institutional funds just don't want to invest at that stage. It's too early, too risky, you know, too little capital um, that they can deploy. Um, so that's sort of what we are focusing on. And, you know, it's been now a year and a half. Um, you know, we raised about $47 million for the fund. Uh, we've invested about 20 companies so far. Um, it's still early. Some of them have gone on to raise, you know, follow on rounds of financing. Uh, but we've been, you know, just really, um, just really enjoying the journey. And it's been, it is such a pleasure to get to work with just really incredibly smart people. Um, you know, they're just getting off the ground. They're, you know, betting the farm and, and, and to do, to change the world. And we get to be a small part of their, part of their journey. Wow. Very cool. And, and uh, can you give us a sense of some of the, like the types of companies that you invest in? Yeah, so we, uh, so the biggest thing for us is obviously, you know, we want to invest early, right? Um, because we're sensitive around kind of the price of the, the company and, uh, and and the risk and so on and so forth. But we love um, the found, the kind of founders we, we like to invest in are, are very product centric, right? Very maniacally mm-hmm. obsessed about building a product and, and have like non-obvious product insights. Um, you know, the use case and the application is very clear. And in terms of the actual industry or sector, we're, we're a little bit less um, kind of uh, hung up on. I mean, so we do stuff in B2B, we do stuff in B2C, um, as long as, again, there's a clear use case and application. Uh, so to give you an example, you know, we invested, for example, in a company called BoxBot, which is building uh, these robots, autonomous robots for parcel delivery, right? So 50% of the cost of, a, you know, delivering a parcel, and an Amazon parcel to your house is literally in that sort of last hundred meters, right? When the UPS or FedEx driver stops outside your house, walks around the truck, put, you know, picks up the box and drops it at your doorstep and then does that over and over again. So the idea here is could we drop off these all these parcels for a neighborhood at a hub and then the robots would deliver to your house when you get there, right? So these are founders that came out of Uber and Tesla, saw this problem firsthand, had you know the right engineering backgrounds to build this product, uh, left these companies because this product wouldn't fit the roadmap for either Uber or Tesla. Uh, so to start this company, and, and we were you know one of the first investors to invest in the company, um, or you know a company like Overtime, uh, which is started by Dan Porter, who um, previously built the game Draw Something. Um, you know that was acquired yeah. by Zynga. Um, you know his insight. You know, he was at WME uh, prior to this. And his insight was that. Uh, the new generation doesn't want to watch three-hour games on ESPN, right? They instead consume media, uh, sports, you know, or others um, on social media, right? These small snippets of 10, 15, 30-second content. Um, so what he started off with is built this app called Overtime where 
um, millennials can uh, film high school sports content, whether that's basketball and, and uh, football, and then apply Snapchat-like filters on top of it. So if you measure you're dunking the ball, it's like fire comes out of the, the <laughs> ball. So to make it more entertaining content too, right? It's not just about the actual, you know, the sports um, piece part of it, but also kind of overly an entertainment layer. Sure. And then this content goes viral. Um, and that company has done incredibly well, um, you know, um, and has grown to tens of millions of video views a month. Uh, so, you know, you see this very, um, I, I, I give, share these two examples because they're like so different from each other <laughs> uh, in, in so many different ways. But it gives you a sense of like the, how wide the aperture is, right, for, for stuff we're, we're investing in. Um, you know, invested in a company that's building workflow automation software for janitorial companies, right? Mm-hmm. And this is sort of uh, in the theme of, uh, software is going to permeate every part of industry, right? Mm-hmm. So the idea here is there's 800,000 commercial cleaning companies in the U.S. alone, and they're all run on pen and paper, right? So the idea is when the cleaner comes into the in, you know the office to clean, they're literally signing in on a like paper timesheet, right? And they're signing out and and they're they're ordering supplies. Again, it's all just done on pen and paper. So you know these cleaners all have smartphones. Why can't they just check in saying I'm at the I'm at the job site, or they want to order supplies, they can just do it from the app, or they have an issue, they can file that right into the app it makes it a lot easier for the for the owner that runs the company to to manage the the workforce so you know simple stuff like that from conceptually but very powerful when it's applied to these these industries um it's done stuff in esports uh we've done stuff in fintech we invested in a company that's uh, that's issuing credit cards to millennials that don't have a credit score yet, right? So I remember when I turned 18, I mean, I didn't have a credit score, so I couldn't get a credit card, so I had to get my parents just, you know, be guarantors, um, <laughs> right. you know, but hey, these days, you know, because we can easily get your cash flow data, we can just hook into your bank account and see that you've been paying your cell phone bill, that you've been, you know, you make some money, you pay rent, and just based on that, we can give you a credit card. You don't have to get a guarantor. You don't have to get a securitized credit card. And so anyway, uh, just give you an example of some of the stuff you've invested in. But we keep a very open mind um, on the kind of stuff that we'll invest in. We are very fixated on the kind of entrepreneur that we want to invest in. And we, you know, we let the entrepreneurs kind of point us to where the opportunities are and where the future is going to go. One of the uh, lesser known challenges for being a, a, in VC is being able to do these like 30 second clips on all of your portfolio companies. So kudos to you for, uh, for uh, that's, a, that's a good skill set you have. I probably went way over 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all good. Uh, so for f- a lot of people think VC or you know, investing is, is kind of very mysterious and, and alluring. From your perspective, what, is, what do you like about it, uh, you personally, and what's hard about it that most people might not think about? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, venture, just like any other career, there's no like better or worse career, right? It's like really to each to each their own. Right. Um, you know, the analogy I use um, to describe venture is like, you know, the sports analogy of like coach versus athlete, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we're sort of the coaches in that analogy and the <clears throat> entrepreneurs, right? The founders that build a company are the athletes, right? They're the ones day to day executing and building products and, and making sales and, uh, and and so on and so forth. So, but on the flip side, you know, when these companies are successful, they also get all of that glory, right? It's just mm-hmm. like athlete, right? Like people know LeBron James, but pe- far fewer people know the coach, right? right. Of the, the Cavaliers, right? <laughs> and, 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 and that's just how it is in our world as well. And I think LeBron James, um, you know, he obviously loves being an athlete. And I think he may make a poor coach. I don't know if he will actually be, a, you know, if he ever decides to be a coach, if he'd actually be good at it because he's just such a good athlete, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's really hard to learn from him because nobody, or very few people have the kind of skills, that just talent, just sheer talent that he does. And he'd probably be really impatient if he was ever a coach. So, you know, the reason I, I, I start with that is because, um, you know, it's not to say that, oh, well, being a coach of the Cavaliers is a better job than being yeah. the athlete. Or, or, well, no, the athlete is better. Well, no, I think if you're, a very successful coach like that's what you that's what you love doing and, right and and that's what you want to do um so um so anyway so that's that's sort of um you know for me personally i i chose this path and i, I love it is because that just resonates so much more for me but mm-hmm. you know i i i think what is important though is to have some operational background in um before you 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 jump to this side of the equation um partially just to 
figure out if you want to be the athlete or the coach. Right? Yeah. And it's important to be able to contrast. Uh, but also just to kind of get some experience because you are ultimately, you know, uh, working with these entrepreneurs day to day. It's like, you know, if you, you know, and, you know, it's interesting to kind of extend the analogy. A lot of coaches actually were athletes for a little bit. Obviously, were not very successful, right? Mm-hmm. And they only did that for a few years, but then had an illustrious kind of coaching career. Uh, but it's important to have played some of that sport, right? Yeah. You can't completely be um, you know, be, uh, be completely, you know, blank on that. So, um, so anyway, I, I, to me, what's, what's the most compelling is the opportunity to work with really, really smart people doing incredibly interesting things, um, in all different parts of the world, uh, or, or different, different industries. And I get to be there, be a part of that journey from, from the get go. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and the thrill and the adventure is, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I think at some level, I also enjoy being an investor, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, rather than an operator. What that means is like you invest, you know, X amount of dollars, and you hope to make, you know, some multiple of that, you know, downstream. I think that idea is also just really, um, really resonates with me. Um, yeah, I think in the lifestyle, um, you know, just a whole bunch of different reasons. I, again, I, I, I did an experiment, right? I found our collective first before I decided to do this full time, and I just felt like. Um, felt like that that was that really worked well for for what I wanted to do. It's also such a um, uh, you know fulfilling career from a, a learning perspective mm-hmm. and, and broadening your uh, your horizons. Right, every every day I probably hear like three to four pitches, and because we're we're not focused on any one sector, I get to learn about all these different industries right. and you know what makes you know certain things tick and and. You know, and and that is just a special kind of vantage point to have. Totally agree. I mean, that that last point that's what that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Yeah. Just that curiosity. So, what is what is hard about it? Yeah, you asked me the second question. Yeah. Um, what's hard? Uh, several things. I think number one is that the performance feedback loops are very very long. Mm-hmm. Right. So, what I mean by that is because we invest at the pre seed stage, we invest very early. By the time these companies have matured and you know you really know whether it's going to be a good company or not could be many years could be five sometimes ten years right Mm -hmm. and uh and i i can't think of many other industries where like the feedback loops are that long right um you know when i was product manager you build a product you launch it within three months you know whether it's a successful product or not (laughs) right maybe six months tops right uh here you just don't know for so long and on top of that there's so many inputs that go in to make something, to make a company successful or, or not, that your input is just one of many, right? So it's right. really hard to know whether you are a good VC or not in either scenarios, right? Whether the company was successful or a failure, right? Because maybe you had picked a good company, but then the market changed, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you couldn't have predicted that, right? Or a regulatory framework change or something like that, right? Um, so so, I, so anyway, it, it's it's really hard to tell, um, you know, whether whether you're you're really good at the job or not. I think the other part is you, you are also um, not directly, you know, uh, I- involved in the company or involved in the execution, right? You're you're very indirect. So, you know, I, I may give advice to the founder. I may give a certain recommendation. They may or may not take it, right? Right. Uh, and I think. To, to some level that's like unfulfilling, right? Where you're not able to actually directly affect the outcome of, of the company or uh, or the product. Um, and you you're can, sort of you sitting can, on the sidelines. You can drop the plays, but you can't slam dunk. That's exactly right. <laughs> well, well you, you draw the plays yeah. and all the, fa- all the athletes agree, yep, that's how we run the play. But then something happens, right? Maybe the opponents like change the, um, the configuration and then the players should be empowered to re- redo the play right, on the right. fly and, and, and something completely different happened that happens than, than what you you know what you had envisioned then that it is what it is. You yeah. you live with that. That's a part of the job. You can't you can't go run the play yourself, right? Um, uh, even if your players are screwing up, right? So I think that part is definitely uh, a little tricky as somebody who'd been on the operating side, as somebody who'd been, you know, uh, a product manager. Um, but it, it, that's why I say there's no like perfect kind of like oh this is a perfect career or job. I think as long as you're comfortable with that, uh, with those sort of downsides, um, you know I think it's a very fulfilling career. Awesome, awesome. Well, great to great to learn more about what you're doing. A um, few other questions uh, for uh, before we sign off here. What do you like to do for fun? <laughs> what do I like to do for fun? Uh, Besides, you know. 
take the VC world by storm. I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, my, my wife and I, um, we love to travel a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we've been, we've been, you know, we traveled through Europe. We're planning to travel through Asia this year. Um, so we, we love to do that. And, and this job allows me to kind of work remotely um, even when I'm traveling. And, and so I've, I've, been, I've been doing a lot of that. Uh, I love to play like cricket. I, I grew up playing cricket, oh, yeah? and uh, and I found a circle of friends here that also uh, play cricket. So that's uh, yeah. I guess it's the sport that you know because you grew up on it, right? It's sort of you know uh, I, I find that to be most uh, most fun. So I, I, I do that. Um, you know, we also moved to the moved to the city here in San Francisco about a year and a half ago. So we're we're, we're investing a lot and just getting to know people here. Um, we recently joined the the battery. Uh, you you've been out there. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, uh, I've heard about it. Yeah. yeah, they have a lot of events, so we you know we, we try to partake in those. Um, what else? Um, you know, the nice thing about living in San Francisco is there's so many things to do around here. Yeah, it's true. Uh, so you know, every now and then we find ourselves in Napa and Half Moon Bay. My wife and I got married in Half Moon Bay. Um, you know, go down to Big Sur and so on and so forth. So a lot of like just tr- traveling. I'd say whether that's short trips or long. Um, is what I do. I love to read a lot. Uh, actually, recently I've been listening to a lot of podcasts. I feel like podcasts yeah. are sort of the new books, you know, where yeah. you get to like hear a perspective from the contemporaries and on all kinds of interesting topics, um, including obviously venture and startups. So I've been doing a lot of that. Um, do you have any favorites? Man, I like try to just like randomly explore. I, I actually optimize a lot for the people on, that are like being The interviewed. guests. Yeah, the yeah. guests, right? Yeah, 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 and yeah. I try to follow them wherever they go. <laughs> right, right. Um, Ray Dalio from Bridgewater or whatever, he's really interesting. Have you ever okay. heard his podcast? No, no. I always no. find him such an interesting guy. Okay. Um, I started to listen to podcasts from people that are not in tech but like have, are very thoughtful. Sure. Um, actually, Naval, though he's in our space, he's also very thoughtful. Um, I like him a lot. Um, I listen to podcasts from, you know, like Airbnb founders and, and others around kind of scaling startups and kind of what made them successful. Um, so random, random stuff. I'm looking forward to hearing other guests on your podcast series mm-hmm. whenever that gets launched. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, a um, bunch of random stuff. Cool. Cricket is uh, a lot of fun. I you ever played? Never, I never played until, um, I, I don't know, I was on a work trip. Like I was, I was doing some training, engineering training. And the the trainer was uh, was a guy from from India, and afterwards he knew I was from out of town. He said, "Hey, why don't you come with me and my friends and go play cricket?" This was like in St. Louis, Missouri, huh. or something, randomly, and I had a blast. And but the thing I remember so clearly was catching that heavy wooden oh, ball, uh, that very hard ball, with my bare hands. And how much that hurt, uh, and relative to the baseball where you where you have the glove, I it, I gained a new respect for cricket uh, after that. Totally, totally, <laughs> no gloves, and it's it's it's, a, it's like a leather you know outside casing, and then like yeah. there's like a metal piece actually inside. Is that what it is? Okay. It's heavy. It's yeah. heavy. Um, no, it's an interesting sport, uh, and it's also really complicated when it comes to like all the rules. Oh, I didn't uh, absorb any of the rules. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You try to like it, you try to follow the rules. It's just it makes no sense. But I think when you grow up with it, it's sort of second nature. Cool. So uh, here's my my favorite question, uh, which I sent you ahead of time so you could think about it uh, in in a very gentle way. Uh, but the question is, uh, what do you believe that other people don't? What's your most unpopular opinion? Yeah, um, I mean, I think I'll share one that's sort of in our um, in our space. Uh, you know, a lot of people. So the conventional wisdom is uh, that when you're evaluating startups, uh, that the market size matters a lot, mm-hmm. right? And the market opportunity matters a lot. In fact, um, I mean, if you look at outside of tech, I think Warren Buffett said, right? Like, if if I had to pick between market and a management team, I'll always pick the market mm-hmm. over the management team. Uh, I actually believe that the market opportunity doesn't matter. Right, and mm. here's why. Mm. I think the best companies don't really know when they get started what market they're really going after. Mm-hmm. Right, and the 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 best founders start off with what could be arguably a small market, but pivot their micro pivot or whatever their way into a really bar- large market opportunity. Mm. So I think it's um, a fool's errand to really try to understand the market opportunity early on at the stage that I'm investing in, right? Mm-hmm. Which is mm-hmm. like sort of pre-seed. 
Um, I'll give you an example. I, I was listening to one of the founders of Airbnb's podcast, and, and if you haven't, you should totally. Uh, Brian Chesky, it's like it's such an entertaining podcast because he talks about how when they got started, the Airbnb, um, the market they were going after was bed and breakfast. Right. right. They wanted right. to build essentially a marketplace for bed and breakfast. Right. Right. Uh, which they put in their slide deck. The market opportunity, the market size was like thirty million dollars. Right. That's what wow. they believed the market size was. And they got feedback that um, that uh, on uh, VCs don't like M's in their uh, in their in their fish tanks. They like the B's, right? The billions. Right. Um, right. So literally on the fly, they changed the number from thirty million to like three billion again, just like making shit up. Right? So. Um, but but you know you 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 cater to the audience. Um, and they started off kind of building a marketplace for bed and breakfast, and, and they got some success doing that. And then at some point they realized that, um, you know, why does the host need to be at home to like make breakfast? Why can't we just kind of make it, you know, such that the host doesn't have to be there and it's just like, just sort of, you know, I guess, um, you know, peer to peer rentals, right. right, essentially. And so now suddenly they've expanded the market opportunity, not just to bed and breakfast, but like, I guess, you know, all ho- but not all hotels necessarily because, you know, hotels are a different experience, but like something that's much larger, right? Mm. And then they did that and they were successful at it. Um, and now they have expanded the opportunity further where they just want to own travel, right? The, yeah. the new products that launches around experiences, right? Yeah. So not just where you're staying, but how you're getting there, what you're doing in this city that, that you're in. Uh, so, and I, I give you a similar example with Uber, right? Actually, my, my old fund, Founder Collective, I wasn't there at the time, but, um, but Founder Collective was a seed investor in Uber, right? And, um, and and at the time when, when we made the investment in 2010, I think it was, Uber, um, all they wanted to do was build a marketplace for black cars, right? Because right? they noticed an opportunity where it was very hard for consumers to order a black car, black car drivers were sitting idle for 50%, 50% of their time, so they felt there was an opportunity to build something through mobile. If you had really quizzed the founders at the, founders at the time, I bet you, um, they didn't have Uber X or Uber Pool or Uber Express Pool and Uber right. Shop or whatever Uber Eats on the roadmap, right? Mm. That was not the opportunity that they even they could have fathomed, mm. right? Uh, and I think it's um, and I think it would have been obviously in this case foolish to kind of just look at black car as a market and say, oh, that's not a really big market opportunity and pass on the deal, mm. right? I think I think because kudos to just how great those founders were that they executed on the on the smaller opportunity really well and then sort of you know broaden the market size so anyway long story short um, what we look for um, are founders uh, that have you know some of those characteristics where you know they will as they as they capture a hill will kind of set their sights higher and capture bigger and bigger hills so you kind of look for that DNA in the founders but also ones that have an amazing amount of clarity on the short term, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And we believe that with you know great founders that can execute in the short term will then give them the latitude to go after something bigger, right? What that mm-hmm. something bigger is, nobody knows. And right. I think if you force yourself to kind of come up with the answer, I think you're gonna be wrong, <laughs> right? Um, because the founders don't know what that bigger opportunity is. How can I as an investor come up with that? Mm. Um, so, so that's sort of how we think about it, um, and, and, and that's why you know I kind of keep going back to like finding the the right found, the you know the founders that have that ability to execute at that at that level, um, you know because the other type of companies we get to we look at are ones where the founders actually have a very big vision, right, a really big market that they, they're going after, but actually don't really know what they want to, what they're going to do in the short term. Where they want to start? Right? Where they right. want to start? How they're going to penetrate the market? You know how they're going to generate some traction, how they're gonna get something off the ground. And we shy away from those opportunities. I'm mm. sure some of them will end up being great companies, uh, but we believe that if the companies can't execute in the short term, um, um, you know, beautifully, where they are perceived to be just onto something, that they won't get the chance to do something much larger. Um, That's an interesting observation. Um, yeah, I, pre- I, I, see what, I see what you're saying. There's a common thread, too, throughout this podcast, is, the benefits of short-term thinking, which is kind of again counterintuitive. I know it has a negative connotation, you know, for yeah. for, for 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 good reasons too. I mean, I think there is definitely 
um, a negative side to short term thinking. Yeah, no, no, no. Right? You, um, you made it, you made a strong case. Yeah, don't, don't worry. But, but I think I think there are there are two sides of the coin. Yeah. Um, when it comes to short term thinking. Awesome. Uh, last uh, question for you. What advice do you have for a young person who's interested in this whole world, um, whether they're in college or right out of college or even in high school? What's your advice for, for people? Yeah, a, a lot of what we were talking about, which is, um, you know, keep an open mind, start somewhere where you're excited, but then keep iterating, mm -hmm. right? Because um, I think what you may end up doing long term uh, maybe something you can't even imagine right right now, and I think have that kind of mindset of you know being comfortable with change um, and and sort of that you know very much iterative mindset, especially early on. Uh, you know, I, I talk about you know again optimizing for short term, so on and so forth, and really discovering yourself. I think it's important to take the time to reflect and uh, and and meet a lot of people, meet a lot of different perspectives, and then kind of. You know, ask yourself what you want to do. I mean, this is where I think business school was really good. You know, for me, where, because I've I've been out in the real world for a few years, and the, but it gave me a chance to then kind of take a step back and and figure out figure out what's next. So you know, find put yourself in those situations. Um, be something that'll be that'll be beneficial. Um, yeah, I, I think there's no one right answer, right, for <laughs> for, for for anything. And I think finding what works best for you is is I think most important. I feel like sometimes people do you know, uh, very much uh, in the quest for that ultimate truth or that ultimate, you know, answer. I, I just don't think that that exists. Um, yeah. uh, I think there's a lot of different variations to everything and and that's that's okay. Find your own truth. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I think that's it. Where can people find you, like on social media or, or, or your firm? Yeah, we're very accessible. Um, so the the fund the fund our our website is afore a f o r e dot v c. Um, I am on Twitter at g jane. That's g as in George j a i n. Um, and my my email is just my first name at afore dot v c. Awesome, awesome. I'm sure you'll be getting some emails. Awesome. Looking thanks, forward to it. Thanks so much for being on the pod. It's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for doing it. All right, appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Epic Human Podcast. Please remember to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever app you happen to be using. And if you want to keep up to date on the latest Epic Human Podcast, please follow us on Twitter or Facebook at Epic Human Pod. And if you have any ideas for guests or feedback on the show, please reach out. I would love to hear from you. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.